Determination is one of the perfections. It's the perfection that sets a goal and decides to see it through. It's aided by some of the other perfections, like patience, endurance, truthfulness. In fact, the Buddha, when he's talked about determination, said there are four qualities that are needed to see it through. To engender the, even the desire that you want to take a determination. And to make sure that it succeeds. The four are discernment, truth, generosity, and calm. And you notice the discernment comes first. Because it's the discernment that sees that there's a certain job that needs to be done, a quality that needs to be developed, or certain qualities that need to be overcome, something to be accomplished. We're not just sitting here and enjoying the present moment. The present moment is a means to something higher, something better. It requires discernment to see that, and also to figure out how to do it. First, you've got to choose a good goal. Make sure that you've determined on something that really will pay off, something that really will be beneficial. And then you've got to figure out how to do it, both in the sense of the steps that are needed to be done and also how to get yourself motivated. Because you know what works. And if you don't know what works with your mind, you try to find out. If you feel intimidated by how large the task may be, or if you feel daunted by it, try to break it down into small steps. In other words, figure out what's the first thing that needs to be done, what's the next thing that needs to be done. Well, just do that one thing and then the next thing. Take it one step at a time. I found in my own case that if I have a new project to work on and it seems intimidating, the first day I work on it will be toward the end of my work period, when I have only half an hour, 15 minutes to work on it. So I don't have very high expectations about what's going to be accomplished. When the expectations aren't so high, then you find that you can do something. It's when your expectations are too high that you feel overwhelmed. Like when you're meditating on the breath right now. If you think about it, you're going to be here for a whole hour or for the whole night. That's too much to take. You say, I've got this one breath. Okay, now this breath. And now this breath. Take it one breath at a time. Then be responsible for it right now. You don't have to be responsible for the rest of the hour. Take responsibility for what you're doing right now. The step that can be done right now. Focus on that. And when that's done, you find that you've picked up a little bit of momentum, so you can move on to the next step and then the next. So this is part of discernment. Figure out where your inner obstacles are, what they are, and then how you can get around them. But that, of course, requires having some knowledge about what needs to be done, and also some different techniques for motivation. Sometimes you find yourself motivated by a sense of heedfulness, in other words, realizing that if you don't do the job now, it's not going to get easier as time goes on. And if you don't do it yourself, nobody else is going to do it for you. We have that phrase in the chant, may all beings look after themselves with ease. And I've noticed a lot of people whose Dharma practice falls off to the wayside. It's because they don't know how to look after themselves in the sense of maintaining their motivation, maintaining their, their fighting spirit, maintaining their sense of what needs to be done, and also looking after themselves to make sure that they're doing well, that they're not pressing themselves too hard, they're not letting themselves off too easy. If you get kind of slack on things, and in those slack mind states, all kinds of other things can sneak in.
then you find suddenly find your, your inner conversation changing. So you have to be very careful about who gets admitted into the committee and who has a voice in the committee inside. These are all different factors of discernment that can help you with the remaining factors, like truth. Truth means you make up your mind to do something and you really do it. You notice that this is one of the qualities of the great Ajahn. So John Lee and John Mahabha talk a lot about the vows that they would make in their practice. And I found that it would be difficult in the beginning, but as you got more used to it, it becomes easier as you go along. Again, that's a matter of momentum. And you know what momentum is. If you're sitting still, it, it's a tendency just to sit still. But if you start moving, then it's easy to keep moving at that same speed. And you push a little bit more and you get faster. And you push a little bit more and you get faster. So the first oomph sometimes is, hard, is the hardest of all. Once you get going, then, however, it's necessary that you maintain it, because momentum can run out. So you've got to figure out ways of keeping yourself nourished as you practice. So you really stick with things. Here it's good to have a sense of honor. You don't hear much about the word honor in, in Dharma circles. It's essentially a sense of look how you feel you look in other people's eyes. Now, there's a way in which we're not supposed to be concerned about that. You notice this, especially when you go out in the forest and you're alone, you realize that the opinions of a lot of people around you just fade away at that point. But you don't want everybody to fade away. You don't want the noble ones to fade away. You don't want the wise to fade away. You want to think about, that, about them. And Zabuti recommends that think about the wise people who have powers who can read your mind. How do you look in their eyes? That's a way of making sure that you stay on the path. And when you talk to the Kalamas, you not only said you test things by how they give results when you put them into practice, but also you test them against the opinions of the wise. You really take those into consideration. It's not just your own measurement of things. You want to take their standards and you want to live up to their standards. Take their advice seriously. One of the reflections that the Buddha recommends is you ask us every day, is there anything in my own behavior that I can criticize? And then he goes on from there, is there anything that those who know, those who are observant, anything in my behavior that they could criticize? So have that sense that they're watching you, and you want to look good in their eyes. Because after all, we're trying to get a position where the Buddha said, we have the precepts that are pleasing to the noble ones. In other words, if they saw what we were doing, they would be pleased by our actions. That's one of the ways in keeping yourself going on the path, maintaining your truth, sticking with your vow. Nest for generosity basically means giving up things that get in the way. And learning how to do that with a sense of calm. Those two go together. You get worked up about how you're going to have to give up this or have to face this hardship. Try to calm the mind and say, okay, I can do this. This is not beyond human cap capability and not beyond my capability. And so whatever voices inside get in the way, whatever likes that you have that you're going to have to abandon, remind yourself you can do without those things. This is why it's good to test yourself in the practice. Can you do without X for a couple of days? Can you do without Y for a couple of days? Can you fast for a couple of days? And you go without speaking to people for a couple of days. If you have whatever the job is, can you just sit down and do it and see it all the way through and give up whatever it gets in the way? An important part of that is calming your mind, the realization this is no big deal, this is nothing overwhelming. Because if you get all worked up about the things you have to give up, that makes it harder and harder for them to be given up. And it's your getting worked up about it. That was the problem to begin with. 
to try to calm the mind and give up those attitudes that would get in the way. You learn to identify them as separate voices in the mind, the voices that you don't have to identify with. This is where the discernment comes in again. It informs all of these qualities. To be truthful, you have to know how to think about maintaining things, how to set a pace that you can maintain, and how to give yourself encouragement along the way, and how to use that sense of honor. I was reading recently someone saying that the Buddhist instructions on maintaining celibacy have to do a lot with the embarrassment you would feel if you stopped in front of in other people's opinions of you if you stopped. And someone was saying, well, this is really wrong. You shouldn't be concerned about other people's opinions. That's a matter of conceit. Well, no, it's not. It's a matter of honor and also a sense of shame, which the Buddha said is an important element on the path. You'd be ashamed to do something that would look bad in the eyes of the Noble Ones. That's an element of discernment that's useful in maintaining truth. And it requires discernment to see the things that you have to give up and to calm the mind in order to be willing to give them up with a sense of ease, with a sense that you're not being asked to do anything superhuman. So discernment underlies all of these things. It's the motivator. It's the planner. It's the part of the mind that sets the goals and learns how to foster all the other qualities that will see them through. So if you find yourself having trouble embarking on a task or keeping up your momentum, look into the various ways that your discernment is not working right now. It's not that you don't have discernment, it's just a question of putting it to use. This is one of the reasons why when I translate the word panya in English, I found that discernment is the best use of it, <clears throat> the best equivalent, better than wisdom. One time a John Fruin told me to use my banya when I was having problems in meditation. I told him, Lord, that the reason I'm meditating is because I don't have any banya, thinking that it meant wisdom. He said, no, everybody's born with some. It's simply the question of whether you're willing to use it or not. So even though we may not all be wise, we at least have some discernment, and the discernment gets better as you use it, as you employ it in setting good goals figuring out what needs to be done, figuring out how you can encourage yourself to do it, figuring out how you don't have to be overwhelmed by the task. And maintain your ability to be truthful, to give up the things that are going to be getting in the way, and how to keep the mind calm through all of this. When you put your discernment to use, it grows, and then it can do all of these things and see you all the way through. <laughs>